Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Roland Bleicher. I'd like to welcome you for this last event of uh, this semester, uh, an event with Professor Susan Best from the University of uh, from Griffith University. And we're absolutely delighted to have uh, Sue with us to talk about, and in some sense, I guess, launch also her latest book, uh, It's Not Personal, Post-1960s Body Art and Performance. But before we introduce uh, to and before we start our discussion, I want to kind of introduce uh, my co-host, uh, um, Dr. Federica Caso for today. Um, Federica and I have been collaborating for a long time. She is an absolutely wonderful scholar, has recently completed her PhD here at, uh, at UQ, uh, working on a range of fascinating topics linked to visual politics and other aspects from questions of militarization to indigenous settler relations, to questions of, of uh, also uh, uh, body politics, in some sense, the topic for today. Uh, one of many, many uh, publications of Federica is an article in international, in international Political Sociology, which just came out uh, a few days ago. So I'll pass on uh, to Federica. Thank you for the introduction, Roland, and welcome, Sue. Um, so before we start, I would like to um, pay our respects to the traditional owners uh, of the land on which me and Roland are gathering today, um, the, Jag the Jagara peoples from the south of the river and the Turbo people from the north side of the river. And we would like to acknowledge that their sovereignty of this land was never ceded. Um, and then I'll pass it to Roland to introduce Sue. So we're absolutely delighted to have you with us, Sue. Uh, yeah, professor Susan Best is Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art History at Griffith University. And she's been uh, with our visual politics program numerous times over the last few years. And, and Sue is, is incredible. She sort of writes books at the pace that I and most other people write articles. It's uh, it's very uh, impressive and and very um, uh, uh, inspiring to see her both her quality and her her, her prolific sort of output. Uh, two of of several books that have made have had uh, major awards and had a major impact are um, visualizing feeling, affect, and the feminine avant garde and reparative aesthetics witnessing in contemporary art photography. But the book that we're talking about today uh, is called um, It's Not Personal, Post-60s Body Art and Performance. So, so welcome, Sue. We're absolutely delighted to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Sue, so maybe if it's OK, I'm going to start um, asking you a question. First of all, I want to say that I really enjoyed reading your book. It was almost like a, a palate cleansing after all like that politics of war that I've been studying recently. So, um, but I would like you to um, contextualize your book uh, in the context of your previous work and how, uh, explain to us how um, it relates to the topic of um, visuality and aesthetics. Um, I guess this book is almost like the flip side of the first book, Visualising Feeling, which was a feminist reading of uh, post-60s art history, inserting feeling into the very period where it claimed uh, it didn't exist or artists had deliberately rejected feeling and actually were embracing impersonality. So that one had impersonality as a sort of a subtext and the, the, the repressed term I was rescuing from a feminist perspective was affect. So this one I've gone the other way <laughs> and it's the main frame is impersonality and feeling and emotion are the, um, the subtext, I guess. And this one probably would have been, I was working on this at the first bit of this, before I did reparative aesthetics. So it's 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 not as fast in its delivery, Roland, <laughs> as you think. But uh, reparative aesthetics was looking at shame in particular and shameful history. So it was more, I guess they've all been feminist, but that one was the one that I suppose engaged more specifically with 
uh, political histories, if you like. And this one is more about this, uh, what exactly does impersonality, why is it a value in personality and, and what does it enable in terms of um, art? It, it's been a thing that I think has been hidden in clear sight in that it's in lots of people's commentary just as feeling was in lots of people's commentary but hadn't been thematized as a particularly important theme I guess um, is how I would so the three books are sort of interrelated I often say to students it's like the yogurt principle I take a bit of the culture of one book and it produces the next one but I'm uh, then they're quite distinct in terms of what they've they're achieving but feminism a deconstructive sensibility would be the other thing that goes so whenever I see a sort of a binary I'm wanting to complicate it so hence the impersonality and affect are two things that seem like they should be mutually exclusive but the books are trying to say no in actual fact they're not maybe we could start uh, the discussion of the whole notion of personality with the way you actually start off your book in the sense that you use uh, two very classical texts. You use the work of Walter Benjamin, uh, who's sort of arguing that art isn't or shouldn't really be just personal. It should really also have a political role. It should be you now part of a revolutionary movement. So in that sense, there's a movement from the personal to, to the political. But you also use, you're also using sort of Roland Barthes' argument that that any kind of art, visual art or textual art, is always more than personal because it's always embedded in the kind of traditions of texts and visuals and meanings that are inevitably part of how you are. So you use these two very different ways of moving beyond the personal for your work. Can you maybe say a bit more of the rationale for that move or how, how you're using Bart and, and Benjamin for that? Or? They, they were, when I was an undergrad, and I think probably still so, sort of, um, and I went through a, so an art history department that was Marxist, so it was a social history of art was the main frame. So those, that Benjamin, Benjamin position was incredibly important. That idea of art having social political purpose was very much the way I was taught art history. And I guess this French theory came into, also came into force. I did the French theory in the philosophy department with people like Liz Gross. I wasn't doing it with, um, it wasn't in art history. So I had those two, <laughs> I guess, tensions were part of the, my formation. And at the time I put them together as if it was unproblematic. And then the book, I, re-looking at them, I thought it was intriguing, these two tendencies. The French theory basically saying, you know, everything is intertextuality, nothing's original. And on the other hand, this political push that was saying you need to deliberately, the, the Benjamin and argument that you need to deliberately embrace the political and turn away from the personal. So it was... I guess unpicking my own formation in some ways. And it, part of that was thinking about how those two actually clash rather than, um, rather than being neatly dovetailing into this idea of an anti-humanist position, which I guess do also dominated the humanities when I was an undergrad. And I guess it still does in many ways. So just trying to, I guess, complexify those seminal texts that we tended to assume were easily put together. Um, that was sort of part of the, the impetus. Uh, does that kind of make sense of it? Yeah. Are, are they not usually discussed in combination, Bach and Benjamin, or is that kind of in art history an unusual combination to, to engage? They, they are now. Like, they absolutely are discussed in combination. But I guess my weird training where I was in a Marxist department that had no truck with this terrible French theory <laughs> and my philosophy department that was embracing French theory. It was more the clash of my education, I guess. Mm -hmm. But yeah, by the 90s, I guess, or even the late late, um, late 80s, they were put together regularly. There's a famous book, um, you know, 
I think it's called art after representation or uh, it was a classic new museum of contemporary art reader which had that sort of these are the political readings you should be looking at and they put them together unproblematically normally they would be now but it was just the moment probably that I encountered them it was the warring factions of the you know Marxist social history which was dominant in art history departments um well certainly the one I went to um and philosophy was at that point the particularly Australian scholars were quite key in the recept anglophone reception of French theory so it was yeah the Bart was not really taught in art history in quite the same ways it, it's routine now I think to put them together mm. so I would like to go back to the topic of personal and impersonal art, if I may. And I've got a question around um, the concept of impersonal art and, and how it relates to emotion. Because I think that there is a, so someone might think that uh, impersonal art is somehow art without feelings or that doesn't evoke emotions. But from your book, it doesn't, like it seems that that's actually not the case. So I was wondering if you can articulate for us the relationship between impersonal art and emotions. I think um, impersonality as a concept, like it can mean, I mean, it can mean shared sensibility. If you think of, um, there was a very good, in my first book, there was a excellent quote I had from Sarah Kaufman, where she talked about the fact that the, the artist's feeling had to be not just their own, but typical. So in that interplay, you're moving between an impersonal conception of a feeling as well as a personal one. And I guess feeling itself is defined in those ways where it flickers across between something that we, fe we feel as deeply individual and attached to us, and yet something that's also shared, something that isn't particular to us. So I suppose in the book, um, I am using impersonality as a sort of a break to the, the, the different ways of thinking about uh, emotion. So it's in the, I'm using say intimacy, but then I'm looking at cool intimacy as a way of cutting through that. So I guess I want, I'm interested in these instances where things intertwine rather than being polarized. But I, I guess one way you can think of them as not polarized is to say, well, feeling is, is for it to work in a work of art, it has to be shared. It has to be communicable. It can't be utterly particular. Uh, but I, I don't know whether that's answering your question. That's sort of one, <laughs> one way that I've pulled them together. Uh, and I guess it's uh, the if the feeling part is probably easier to explain, and the imp, and the strat and the strategies of impersonality are. Uh, uh, it's a strange. I mean, it, it's such a long um, from the nineteenth century onwards. Artists seem to want to evacuate themselves from the work of art. So, so the impulse to not have the personal in the work of art is quite long-standing. Um, it, it comes to a head, I guess, in the 60s. But yeah, it's, it's always there. And I guess the classic kind of art that people would think of when they think of impersonal art would be um, conceptual art where, you know, something like Joseph Kassus' One and Three Chairs, where it's literally a, photo, a chair, a photographic a chair, and a dictionary de definition. And you could say that it's utterly affectless and that is the or utterly without feeling and impersonal. But then in my first book, I was looking at the fact that that, that kind of art triggered different emotional reactions. So despite the fact that the artist had seemingly gotten to degree zero of feeling, it provoked viewers to be angry, to be irritated, to be bored. So it's almost like you can't get to a total zero degree of emotion. So that was a kind of another way I've kind of intertwined them. So it's like each time you think you could have totally gotten rid of it, it creeps back in, I think is the way to think about it. 
Mm. So it seems like that the artists are trying, like, are trying to remove their own feelings from the art, but feeling feelings are still present in the way that uh, people receive the work of art. Um, and I do have a follow up question um, on these. When when you were talking about um, the desire for artists to remove themselves uh, from from the artwork, and in the book. Um, you describe impersonal art as, as an urge to, um, or a, as a need to solve, uh, alienate um, from, from the work of art or to, pur to purge themselves from the work of art. But I think that there is a question of power that emerges in your book in the sense that it doesn't seem that um, the artist across um, the spectrum of gender and race have the same privilege uh, and power to remove themselves from the work of art. So I wonder if you can tell us uh, more about, um, you know, who has the privilege and the power to remove themselves from the work of art? Well, I think in the, I can't remember which chapter it's in, I talk about the arts, uh, both, um, I think it's Barbara, Christian uh, who wrote, I think hers is called Race for Theory and I, the other one is Nancy Miller. I mean, they talked to their criticism of the rise of post-structuralism was precisely that, that it, just at the moment where other voices were coming into being, that's the moment where this um, anti-humanism came into being. Rather like, I guess, you could say the same thing now with the sort of embrace of object-oriented ontology, same kind of thing, just as different voices um, come, to, come to a better sense of agency, a better, and I listen to, you have these philosophies that appear to be about um, silencing and that, that, that that's the position, that um, the, the dominant position. I mean, I think that was well made in the, that point was well, really well made in literary criticism in the 80s as the sort of response to the Roland Barthes death of the author. Um, that, you know, feminist voices at that point, I guess, were coming into uh, some kind of agency. And you could say the, the same now around Black, Black Lives Matter, that you get these two, like a, an, I guess it's the it's the ongoing anti-humanism, and it's how one interprets what that what that evacuation of this, whether you see it as an evacuation of the self or a, um, I guess a, a moderation of the self in some way. That might be another again to think about how one could have a sort of an artist or a philosophy, because I guess the way that anti-humanism, that various people have read that art that was about an evacuation of feeling as being an, a parallel of structuralism, exact sort of, uh, they happen roughly at the same time and they seem to have a similar kind of um, trajectory. So it's what, on the one hand, questioning, I guess you'd want to emphasise, well, isn't it questioning the centrality of the human and don't we need to do that? I guess that would be the way one could think about it in more complicated terms, that you can never throw the baby out with a bath water, the human's going to return. And as someone very much schooled initially in deconstruction, it would be managing the return of the human while also wanting to question the centrality of the human think about, you know, the animal kingdom, the natural world, et cetera, et cetera, but not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I guess that would be how I would think about constantly thinking about how things are interimplicated rather than, you know, divided into a sort of binarized way of um, mapping the world. We had a sort of a couple of questions in mind as well about your case studies, but I was wondering if I can follow up maybe on, on this issue a little bit in the sense that you described this sort of transition from the, the, the Benjamin, the, the Marxist, the early Frankfurt School sort of approach to a more post-structural approach. 
and particularly sort of Bob's notion that that yeah we're sort of not just individuals we always are already embedded in, in in societal structures in discursive structures so I was wondering how that links up to what we talked about before about the whole notion of emotions and affect in the sense that that this is more important part of, of your book and of your work in general in many disciplines there's this division between sort of people who focus on emotions which are seen as quite conscious as things we can recognize fear anger empathy or so on and those who write about affect who think sort of you know, these are more like pre-conscious sort of senses that are there before we can even recognize them that are in the background which is in many ways more i guess the sort of the bakhtian post-structural approach how does how, how does this division sort of work out in art history and in your work this between the sort of the conscious emotions and the more subconscious effective forces is that sort of seeping um, into oh I, it definitely i mean i guess it's the split between the two the second my second book i looked at that affect theory debate the Ruth Lays who has been this sort of chief critic of what she sees is that pre-conscious version of affect and she sheets at home to Brian Masumi um Deleuze I'm trying to remember who else is in her list she also throws um Sedgwick in who I don't think is quite so easily categorized as in that kind of more bodily um, pre mode. Um, her, I guess in my, I, I'm less of a, um, I'm less in the, mo in, I guess my theoretical interests are more psychoanalytic. So, and Sylvan Tonkins, I was in this um, reading group for, I think, a decade. I'm still in the same reading group, I have to say. We're just reading different things. But um, we, uh, I read Tonkins very early on, and my friend Liz Wilson has done a reader. She also did one of the responses to Ruth Lays in Critical Inquiry. I think, again, and I'd say Liz is similarly, we were trained at a similar moment, we're both kind of deconstructive. So we never like this either or, <laughs> we always want both and. So I suppose my work has been very much about putting affect in relation to thinking. Um, I don't assume, I don't think it works that way that you have an emotion and you stop thinking. I think the, because I've done a lot of work on Freud I think that whole relationship between affect and representation is very very complicated and it isn't always straightforwardly connected but I'm wanting to think of um, affect as something that is connected to thinking rather than in that kind of more Masumi mode which is sort of pre pre-cognitive um, so I have a, in the sec, in reparative aesthetics, I have a, I go through sort of talking about my disagreement with Ruth Lay's account of Sedgwick and Tonkins, um, while also saying, yes, indeed, that split between shame and guilt that she's looking at um, is indeed something that's operative where, you know, with, again, it's a throwing out of the baby with the bathwater that guilt gets thrown out and you end up with shame. And again, my desire is to sort of have both, to think about both together rather than one or the other. So you can see I'm very much a deconstructionist. I'm unreconstructed after all these years. And, and, and you do that in your case studies too. And it's, that's some, one thing we actually, we did want to talk about in the sense that, that you, your book starts off with this kind of very conceptual introduction and then embarks on a series of case studies on, on body art. And you sort of have a, a certain sort of type of typology that you develop to, to understand the psychological, psychoanalytical, but also the political dimensions of, of, of these body art case studies. So I was wondering if you want to sort of outline a bit, maybe, what the typology is and, and what the case studies do in your book to, to develop that. Um. I guess always as an, we were talking about this before, as an art historian, you're the, I mean, I think because I, I think, I guess, because I went through philosophy and art history, I guess I'm a bit schizophrenic, but the, the, when I get on, to, I think as an art historian, it, the argument has to be run 
through the material of the work. Like it has to be a reading of it that animates the work so that someone else um, starts thinking as your, or you, you know, starts thinking the way you're thinking about the work. Or well, that's the hope anyway, that you persuade them to look at a work in a particular way. And I guess the, the, the tricky thing is to map, to map them, map together both to do, uh, to do justice to the theory and to do justice to the art is the kind of balancing act. Um, in this book, I think previous ones I've tended to focus in on one artist and this one is, is organised, as you said, by typology. So I've gone for one person body art, two people or the couple, and then groups. And it was a way of, uh, I guess, showing the social psychological dimension of body art. Uh, and the way in which relations was quite key to the to to thinking about, say, two person works, um, the type, the group work. Uh, I think that's the sort of area where I'm still incredibly intrigued. Like what, how you how you uh, or how a work of art can can have this reference to sociality, and I think. The group does that in a way that's incredibly interesting. I, I didn't feel like I, I, sometimes I guess when you finish a book, you've had enough of something. And, and that was the bit where I thought, ah, so there's still something of great interest, that dimension of a work of art made out of groups that's attempting to reference the social in different ways. Because I think it's incredibly, incredibly hard to reference something like that in a way that gives an audience a sort of a sense of it. Uh, so yeah, that was the last chapter, which is the the art body artworks that use more than one body. But yeah, it was, I don't even know how the typology came to me. It might be um, a sort of a frustration with some of the writing on body art that it didn't seem to really get at the strangeness of using bodies that was one of the so why at a certain point does this become able to be even used as a medium something that really is something you'd expect in dance or whatever but why did the visual arts decide that it was appropriate and what did what what came forth when you start using bodies in, in that mode. Um, and the, I guess, focusing on the amount, the numbers of bodies gave me a kind of a way of also thinking of uh, what those arrangements um, highlighted uh, in a way that I didn't think had been done in the literature to date. And having taught sort of courses on this, it was partly the frustration of teaching courses on this for some time without material that was actually getting into the practices in a deep way um, to to start to think what they were doing philosophically politically socially and so forth and I think the typology starts giving you or at least it gave me a way to bring those questions up should we go into should we open up yeah, we have a bit more do you have, do you have something else I have Maybe one. Well, I do have one more question, actually, um, and that is um, when I was reading the book, I and I came to your discussion of um, the work of Ullman on Instagram. That made me think about the fact that what you call impersonal art seems to be quintessentially the uh, the art of social media in a way where. Um, social media is providing for a platform for people to, to use their body to say something, to communicate something to an audience, but um, without necessarily, like it's quite impersonal in a way because um, it gives almost like the false, the false sense of intimacy and connection, but in reality, we're really showing very little of who we are, but that we, we, we might be given the impression that um, that we are more connected and more intimate uh, as a result of social media. So I, I was just wondering if you, if you, do you agree with this? Like, do, would, you, would you say that impersonal art fits quite well with 
um, the social media platform as a way of communicating? Well, I think it's the the changes in the web, like the way we communicate now. I I mean, I I, I probably talk about it more in the last chapter where I talk about Angelica Masiti because I use that idea. I don't know how to pronounce his name, his surname, Buell Han. I've never heard anyone say it out loud, um, but he has that idea of the swarm as as the way people behave as a group on the net as and I think that yeah it does bring up a very strange subjectivity because people are the kinds of stupid fights people have on with total strangers is an incredible I mean hence the government's trying to um, talk about platforms like Instagram or whatever as as publishers in order to have someone have responsibility for what people say but yeah I think it is a very strange form of communication on the online and it, it is something I think that artists will increasingly start to wrangle with to try and think through that I mean I think the Masiti work sort of does it having people very separate and yet the citizens band is how they come together and there would be I think there will be other artists trying to tackle what this strange moment means where communication is seemingly immediate and yet, uh, yeah, it's, um, I, well, I guess in that sense it is, it, people take it personally though, I guess that's the other thing. There's the people, the trolls that don't take it personally and then to go back to your point about uh, the Allman work, which is, she was deliberately courting the troll. She was courting these um, types of people that operate online to produce a reaction. Uh, so there, she's she's a very in interesting highlighter of all those weird roles. Because again, it's like they're impersonal. At one, they're aimed to upset people, but they're genres of roles, like the sort of things that she highlights are typical sets of behaviours rather than individual. So it's a sort of a, she uses that work to pull out precisely these set roles that people are playing. Uh, so yeah, it's a very, but it is an intriguing form of communication. And you're very right to say both intimate and, you know, angry making, and yet there are these people that are just manipulating it all, or getting great pleasure seemingly from manipulating it all. Mm. Well, I think both Federica and I have a, several more questions here lined up, but I think that might be a moment perhaps to kind of wrap up the the, sure. the opening, the interview part.